Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. This is the first Delacorte event of the year. Um, the Delacorte Center for Magazines, it's up on the eighth floor. Uh, it's just me. <laughs> but uh, we also have a little magazine rack next to on the eighth floor when you get out of the elevator. And it has two, I just want to point out, it has two levels. The top level are like hard to get old magazines, so you should just kind of flip through them reverentially. And then the, the bottom rack is for just take them. They're, they're for taking home if you want and keeping, or you can bring them back if you're done, either way. Um, and so we also, uh, throughout the year, we, we run a, a series where we bring in um, notable people from the field of magazines and talk to them about um, what their jobs are like and, and what sort of issues they face. Um, so I'm very excited to welcome Lynn Oberlander to the J School. Um, Lynn uh, started her career at uh, in TV general counseling. Is well, that right? That was just regular counseling. Regular counseling. Okay, and then um, then moved on to Forbes. Um, was at the New Yorker for nearly a decade as the general counsel. Uh, then moved to First Look Media, which publishes The Intercept, and is now at Gizmodo Media. Um, so just the, f the format quickly, I am going to, wow, there's an echo. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna ask some questions uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit and then I would like to um, have the audience ask uh, some challenging, uh, difficult, uh, questions about the law and media, um, no uh, kind of questions about your landlord, that's not the sort of legal thing that we, we do. Afterwards is okay. Afterwards, okay, great, okay. Um, great, so, so Lynn, um, tell me, uh, how did you get into this line of work? You know, so um, it's kind of a, a straight line from, from many of you who are students to, for me. I was a college journalist, and I worked at the, the best and the oldest college daily. Um, and I said- The Columbia Spectator? I, the Spectator is pretty good, but- It is pretty it, good. The Yale Daily News. Oh. Um, so the, um, and, and I was concerned that I wasn't a good enough reporter to make a living at it, to be, you know, a Keith Gesson. And so I took a seminar my senior year on media law, and I fell in love with the law, really, about it. I mean, it sets out, some of you guys who have uh, perhaps read it, you know, you read New York Times v. Sullivan, and you read, Richmond newspapers, and it's an incredible vision of the press that we are, that we serve uh, an incredibly important structural role in our democracy. You know, that we are really a fourth estate. You know, I know fourth estate doesn't actually mean that, but we are really the fourth estate, you know, to the, to the tripartite government, and our job is to shine the light on what the government's doing and to make it a better democracy. And, and for me, that was really, you know, the light bulb went off. I was like, wow, I can work in media. I can make my parents happy by being a lawyer. And I can um, do what I want to do and really help our, um, our, you know, society. And so I, um, you know, there were some detours along the way. I knew I wanted to do it, but, you know, I went to law school, which was great, right here. And um, I worked on the law school newspaper, and I actually worked at what was then, I guess, I want to say the Freedom of the Night there was a press center that no longer exists. I think it was uh, night sponsored. Um, but then I became a regular old, you know, corporate lawyer, not corporate litigator. And one day, this job listing for the uh, mid-level litigator at NBC opened up, and it was it, for me, it was fate. And so that was the beginning. And um, it's been a great, you know, career and ride. And uh, every day, I teach media law and. I, because, in fact, this seminar that I took by, I'll, you know, I'll do a little name check, John Zucker, who is still, uh, you know, media lawyer at ABC. At the time, he was at CBS. He had taught the class, and it was, um, so I feel like I should, you know, try to introduce other people to it, and, and that's it. What sort, of, what sort of litigation did you do at NBC? Well, NBC, we, you know, we started, I started as a general litigator, and so there was some First Amendment work. There were some weird... Um, uh, you know, not weird, but some defamation cases. I worked on a big, uh, there was a, if I recall, there was a, we went to trial on a, uh, Dateline had done a story about tired truckers, and one of the, the main subject of the, of uh, the story was not happy with the way he was portrayed in, in the investigation, so he sued for defamation. So I, we worked on that. Um, so we, what happened? 
well, we won, we won in the end. Um, in the end, but it was a you know it was a big it was a big lesson it, because we we won ultimately on appeal. But he had said it, there was he had said that the producer had promised him that this he would participate and it would be a really favorable story. He'd be able to tell his story and everybody would understand that they you know they have to work hard and have to dr drive, and. Um, so when he saw the report, which reported essentially that he was driving well over what was regulated, you know, permissible and breaking the law right and left, he wasn't happy about it. Um, and the court in the end, this is on appeal, held that the kind of alleged promise that we would show you and, you know, you tell your story was not really concrete enough to, to have a, a lawsuit mm -hmm. about. So that was one of the cases. And um, what was the, when you say it was a lesson, what was the lesson? Well, one of the, the lesson really is, and uh, is that journalists who are engaging people and getting trying to get them to participate in stories need to be really, really careful about what they say. And um, and that ha I've seen that actually historically. You know, those you'll you'll tell people, oh, you're going to be happy with this. Um, this will be a chance to get your story out. And what people hear is that this is going to be a favorable story. And, and they will possibly sue on you know, breach of contract. And even if you win the case at the end, nobody wants to go through that, that process of being sued. So there are ways, you know, there are ways around it, right? Journalists who are, uh, who are soliciting interviewees, they should, they should be really clear about what they're promising or not promising, or they should be really vague. You know, sit down, you know, we, we, especially in writing. And vague is great. Yeah, we'd love to talk to you. We're, we think we're doing the story about this, but of course we don't actually know what's going to happen. Our editor may decide that we're covering something else. But any promise that you make, you know, oh, I'll sit with you and I, I agree I won't talk to you about your mistress. Well, you can't then talk to them about their mistress. And, and those things um, um, come up. The other area, actually, and I'll, I'll use this as a bully pulpit, a little bit, is that what comes up a lot is that people forget, uh, the journalists forget that they have made some sort of via email agreement, not really necessarily about the topics, but they say everything you tell me will be on background and I just want to get a preliminary conversation. And then six months go by and they completely forgot that they said that everything was going to be on background. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that does, that happens more than you would think. And that's essentially, essentially that's a contract when you, when you make a promise like that. Well, yeah. Especially in writing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But even orally, mm -hmm. if you're, if it's specific enough, if you, if, um, and it, and then if it's specific enough, you, it's a contract. Got it. Yeah. Um, great. So I want to ask you, I, I, then you went to Forbes. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a pretty famous, uh, in my circles case, um, where you got sued by the oligarch Boris Berzovsky. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, um, I came to Forbes in um, 2001, actually. Um, my first day at Forbes was um, the 10th, September 10th, which obviously is a memorable day um, there. And at that time, we had already, Forbes had actually already been sued. It had been sued over a story that uh, um, an author, Paul Klebnikov, had written about Boris Berezovsky in which they, he had laid out um, a whole array of bad acts by Mr. Berezovsky and had um, also said that there were a surprising number of dead people around him. Um, and in the story, uh, which was called Godfather of the Kremlin, he relayed a piece um, that said that um, that Mr. Berezovsky had been a witness, uh, not a witness, sorry, a suspect um, in the murder of a colleague, I think it was Mr. Listiev, and that the crime was never solved. And so, and it also, by the way, laid out a whole web of uh, financial. It was one of the earliest stories about the loans for shares uh, issues and really a great story. Um, and in fact, if I recall- Sorry, and Listiev yeah. was um, uh, in charge of running a television channel that Berezovsky had bought. Um, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And was murdered. Mm -hmm. And was and was murdered. And the murder was never solved, and it remains not solved. And Mr. Berezovsky was a suspect. He was interviewed by the police. He was released in Russia, and, and he went on and uh, you know became a billionaire. Um, in any case, I came in after the story. He so he, Berezovsky stu sued in in the UK, and it was again not one of the earliest libel tourism cases, but it was a big libel tourism case, and it went up to this pre-internet though, so it went up to the uh, House of Lords in the end uh, because Forbes said, hey, we only have 2,000 copies in the UK, this case should be you know, heard in Russia, 
um, where all these bad acts had happened or heard in the U.S., where all of, you know, where the writer is and where we are, it shouldn't be heard in the U.K. And the House of Lords said, no, you know, we're the House of Lords. We can hear anything we want to. And so I came in. Wait, sorry, but you're, you had a, you suggested going to Russia where they could get a, you're like, Russia has a great legal system. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he could have sued, I mean, at the time when Berezovsky brought the lawsuit, uh -huh. he was actually in, Ber in, London, in Russia, so he hadn't left yet, okay. he hadn't fled to, uh, and all the witnesses were, were in Russia. So yeah, either place would have made more sense in some ways, obviously, Russia does not have a, did not have a great judiciary. But in any case, the British courts decided, as they often do, that they can hear anything they want to, um, and they, we were going ahead then on a libel case. And so um, we were then in the position, and you know, the UK law, and I know that some of you are international students, and, and, the, and the UK law has been revised since then, but basically it was completely the opposite from the American law. And so here, where we have to, uh, where the plaintiff in a libel case would have to prove that what we said about them was false, there, um, the defendant, we would have to prove that what we wrote was true. And that's kind of crucial because the British court also held in our case that um, what, when we said that Mr. Berezovsky was a suspect in the murder of Listia, what we meant and was implied, this meaning of it, was that he had actually killed Mr. Listiev and that we would therefore have to prove in this unsolved case uh, that, that Berezovsky had killed him. So what happened with that case, and it was kind of interesting because by the time, this had, the case had been going on for a few years, and by the time I got there and we were there, Berezovsky had fled um, Russia and was seeking asylum in the UK and, and had been granted asylum, and he was a wealthy guy. Um, and it wasn't in his interest whether or not, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't prove that he had murdered Listiev, and we never said he had, um, but we could prove a lot of corruption. And it became apparent to Mr. Berezovsky that that was not going to be a really successful strategy for him um, in court. And so we uh, basically convinced him, um, we had a couple meetings with him, and we convinced him to withdraw the case, which he did. And we published a statement in court, a, a statement in open court, which we also put in the magazine, which you can find basically saying we never meant to say he killed Listiev, only that he was a suspect. So it was a pretty good outcome. Um, but there is a big coda for this, and which I know you know about, which is why it's well known in your, um, in your circle. So the writer of the piece, and then a book by the same uh, name, Godfather of Kremlin, Paul Klebnikov, who was really, really a great investigative reporter who had spent a lot of time um, on Russia, Russian issues was one of the really earliest on some of the incredible corruption of the um, of the late 80s. Um, went, it became left Forbes, Forbes proper, and became the editor of Forbes Russia, and went to Moscow, and um, and then he was slaughtered in the streets. He was assassinated. He was uh, 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 one of the first, maybe the first, but one of the first of American journalists to be killed. And his um, unclear, you know, who murdered him. He actually had plenty of enemies. Berezovsky said he didn't kill him, but, you know, he didn't have anything nice to say about him. Um, and the, there were some folks who were put on trial uh, for, for the murder, but they w were acquitted. They didn't do it either, probably. It was a pretty much of a show trial. And so that his murder really remains unsolved, which is, you know, horrible. Um, and then Berezovsky himself uh, was found um, dead in his mansion in, uh, in Britain a couple of years ago, and uh, maybe four years ago, uh, in his locked bathroom. And the autopsy was inconclusive. Uh, they, you know, some people thought he had been um, assassinated. Um, I am, of, I am of one of the people who thinks that. And other people, um, believed that it was suicide, he was depressed, he had, he had, had quite a few financial reversals in later years. Um, he, but he for me, he, uh, what, I'm sorry, go ahead. He lost a big lawsuit. Actually. He had yeah. lost a big lawsuit with Abramovich, and mm -hmm. you know, and he, maybe he was you know, depressed, who knows, but um, I don't know. The autopsies were, were in, the inquest, I guess, was inconclusive in the end. And, uh, but for me, it really actually has always you know, shown how incredibly powerful journalism is. We forget that people, I mean, we forget, maybe not here at the journalism school, but that journalists are, you know, are killed for what they write, and they're silenced all the time. So it was, um, 
it, yeah, it was both an interesting litigation, but it, it had a really uh, dramatic and sad coda. Did you did you meet with Brzezowski during mm, the? Yeah, yeah. We How did. did you? What did you think? He was charming. I mean, he really was. He was slick. He was charming. He wasn't that slick. I mean, he was like uh, you didn't think to yourself when you're reading him. Oh, here is a guy who has murdered all these folks to get ahead. Um, and um, he did have, you know, a lot of security around him. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Did you meet him? Ever? Uh, no, no. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting. But he was, he, yeah. So, so, then, um, so then you were at the New Yorker, mm -hmm. and you tangled with the Scientologists. So who was worse? You know, it's interesting. The uh, you know, I'm going to go with the oligarchs, but the uh, you know, the Scientologists. Um, so, Larry Wright, who you know is another phenomenal journalist, was working on a story about this about uh, the Scientol a Scientologist, the Church of Scientology, and Paul Haggis, the film director, and he had at the beginning of his reporting, gone to the church and said, hey, I'm doing the story. I want to work with you. Can you, will you sit down with me and cooperate? And they said, oh, no, we will not. You're not do. We'll, we're happy to have you, you know, come talk to us if you're doing a story about, you know, the Church of Scientology, and we'll show you things, but, you know, you want to write about an apostate, haggis, and we're not interested. And so Larry went off and did his reporting and did a lot of reporting, did great reporting. And then, as you know from The New Yorker, when you're ready to publish, you, we goes through a very pretty elaborate fact-checking process. And so it uh, came to, I think it was August, um, and the fact-checkers had prepared a, and, and the church had said that they would cooperate with fact-checking. So they had said that. So the fact-checkers provided a, a fact-checking document, a list of questions. Maybe it was a little over the top. I don't know. But it was about 900 and some odd questions. <laughs> and they sent it to the church. And, um, and they sent it mm, a couple days before Labor Day. And they said, OK, we're publishing it you know, next week. So please get back to us next you know, Wednesday. And um, the church kind of threw a, went crazy. You know, which is not, frankly, they weren't wrong that way. There wasn't a huge amount of time for them to go through this. But they said, oh, well, you know, this is, these, look at these questions. It's clear that you have a hit job out on us. We've really got to come and talk to you. And, um, we, and we can't do it by next Tuesday. And so we negotiated. And this was me. This was one of what, you know, this was all coordinated through the legal department through me. And we said, oh, okay, well, you know, let's figure out a time. And... There were some pressures because Larry Wright had a show that he wanted was going. He was starring it. It was one of his one person shows. So he, you know, and everyone to publish it. But in any case, we we they came in a few weeks later, and they came in. Um, we had the meeting in our offices, uh, but not actually in the New Yorker offices upstairs in the law firm. There's a in-house law firm. We had it upstairs, and they marched in. It was a rainy day. Um, this is on 42nd Street, and they there were you know four sort of representative of Scientology there, um, pretty high level, and Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise was not there, but his handler was there, um, or one of his historic handlers uh, was there, and um, Tommy Davis was the spokesperson for the Church of Scientology at the time. Tommy David, this is another place where the coda ends up. I'm not, I don't really remember all the history after the fact, but everyone goes on to be a, um, to be really like a interesting person. So Tommy Davis is Ann Archer, the actress. Now you guys are all too young, but she was like a well-known actress uh, when I was your age. It's her son, and he's somebody who had grown up. Actually, he went to Columbia for a year, I think, and then he dropped out to, um, to be at the, um, in the uh, Sea Org. And, don't uh, drop out of... Columbia. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's yeah. the lesson. Yeah. So he, but in any case, where we had a, they came in, four of them came in, um, and then they were followed by like four or five all black clad Sea Org, uh, you know, like workers carrying all sorts, of, or all sorts of equipment, including boxes and boxes, uh, which ended up having binders, like 47 binders of information for us um, about the church. They also brought a VCR and a screen, and we were like, Hey, come on! This is you know Condé Nast. Why are you bringing a, you know your own VCR? But ours didn't work, so it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. Um, and uh, you know we met with them all day. Now it was quite uh, dramatic. There was, I mean, in, ter I mean, in terms of theatrical, it was theater, and it was really a fascinating thing. And and um, I um, 
it was, it, I mean, we, it was, you, got a, you got a real sense of what was interesting to them and what wasn't. And so we had a lot of things that we're all, we had done a really good job, um, obviously, in reporting and fact checking. But the one thing that got them completely red in the face and pounding the table was, the, was when we kind of questioned, uh, when we did question the military record of L. Ron Hubbard, you know, who by this time was long dead. And so that was surprising to me, really. You know, that you don't think that's going to be the thing. You think that claims against David Miscavige of violence, and I mean, they were upset about those too. But the one that really were pounding the tables were, were sort of kind of the, um, the history um, or the false history of, of, um, of their founder. And so then it was really fascinating that we had to incorporate the 47 binders into our reporting, and so we spent the next like six months um, looking into it and reporting it. And every I would I would get a letter virtually every week from their lawyers, telling, threatening us to be warned. You know, you're about to libel us. And Marty Singer and Bert Field, who are famous uh, sort of uh, representatives of celebrities in the on the West Coast, who were representing Tom Cruise and various other celebrities who were mentioned, all were writing letters telling us, you know, to be prepared to to face a lawsuit. Um, they didn't sue in the end, as you might know. Um, and what, what, what they did do is, and it's actually kind of interesting, I think, as a, as a technique, they published a, a parody issue of The New Yorker, um, which they handed out in front of Condé Nast. And it's actually on the Scientology site. You can find it. And the whole, uh, I think the headline is like, the New Yorker, what a load of balderdash. <laughs> and then they had um, lots of reporting about our story. And they, I'm actually in. It's very exciting for me because, you know, lawyers don't get that much attention. And, but we have a, uh, you know, they had a dot, like, in the style of the Wall Street Journal. They, you know, got a little confused about which media they were parroting. But they have a, a dot picture of me and all the other players at this meeting in this great, you know, book about it. Um, and then Larry, you know, as I, many of you probably know, went on to publish it as a book, um, a longer book, did more reporting, and then as a movie, um, which came out maybe last year, two years ago, um, mm -hmm. on, you know, it, the Going Clear on the HBO um, movie, and, and it's been, it's really phenomenal. One thing I am going to say, though, sorry, I, I apologize, because I know I'm like, I mean, I guess it's q and I can monopolize the conversation, but I know you have other questions. But the one thing that struck me about the church, frankly, was that it was a little bit like, um, and I don't mean all of the abuse and allegations of abuse and such and, and the current things, but that it actually, you know, people, what was so attractive about it to all of these people, including Tom Cruise and other, and other celebrities particularly, is, is it was like the Harvard Crimson for people who, oh, sorry, not the Crimson, because that is another great student of newspaper. It was like the Harvard Lampoon uh, for people who, you know, didn't go to Harvard. And it was a way, if you went to the Lampoon, of course, you can get a job writing on a sitcom. And, you know, that's a great entree to making a lot of money and being a showrunner and, and, you know, doing comedy writing. And if you didn't go to Harvard, you could join the Scientologists and you'd get a job in Hollywood. Um, and that was kind of sort of an interesting realization for me doing it. Hmm. That was interesting. Um, and when you were getting these letters every week from their lawyers, did you have to write, do you write back to all those oh, letters? Oh, yeah. Oh, you Absolutely. have to say, and you yeah. say, Puh, you have no case? I mean, yeah, yeah. That? Basically, you say, right. you have no case. As you know, we want to do a fair and balanced and accurate portrayal, and, and you're wrong about these reasons, but rest assured, we will take into account everything you say, et cetera, et cetera. And why do you have to reply to all those letters? It's, is that no, a legal it's obligation? It's not a legal obligation, but if, no, no. But if somebody sues you, you want to be able to say, hey, listen, we acted responsibly. We took this. We answered them. And, um, and mm -hmm. furthermore, we have facts on our side. So just here are the facts on our side. So you don't mm -hmm. want to sue us, really. Wow. So if somebody sends you a bunch of emails and you don't answer them, they can then sue you and get you in trouble. Uh, yeah. For not maybe. answering your emails. That's, yeah, that's uh, yeah. something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, d so you know, at the New Yorker, it has a it has a pretty elaborate kind of process. Um, they, you know, they really love their writers, but then they also love their editors, and they love their fact checkers, and everybody goes through it. And um, at what, po like, what's the role of the general counsel, the lawyer? How do you read the entire magazine? Yeah. So when I was there, I was one of m very few people who read the entire, every single word in the magazine every week. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yes, everything. And was it? F f did you read it? Did you enjoy? Re was it fun? 
Oh, it's it was a great. It's like the. I mean, it's the dream job. It's fantastic. I guess okay. most of the, most of the stories don't have legal issues. Some do. Uh -huh. uh, many, you know, many do. But I was so well educated then. I mean, like, I it was great. Yeah, it was really um, great. But I guess so. I guess I guess part of my question is, you know, are you, you are you reading it with a kind of legal? You're doing a oh, legal yeah. read. No, you're doing right. a legal read, but you're learning a lot along the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, and and now that I'm not working there anymore, I'm back to my old habits of you know not reading everything. Oh, they're piling up. <laughs> oh no, they they are piled up. They are really piled up. But I mean, like, I definitely. Pre-New Yorker and perhaps now, sometimes, although I don't, don't, don't quote me on this, although I guess it's online, so maybe you will quote me on this, you know. I didn't always read the, the arts reviews. I mean, I read the movie reviews, but I didn't always read, um, you know, all of the arts reviews, and, and, not, and sometimes I'm not always reading them now. Um, <laughs> again, sometimes. But, but you did when you but were But I did when yes, I there, absolutely. Yeah. And the restaurant reviews. And definitely the restaurant. Definitely reviews. the restaurant. But reviews. nobody would ever, you know. I was always offering my services as, you know, an add on, add one to go, you know, plus one to go with people. And I don't know. <laughs> only uh, once did that, that happen. Um, definitely the restaurant reviews because the restaurant people sue, or because you're just interested in restaurants. Because my job was to read every single word, but also because, um, you know, generally, obviously, re you know, in terms of a little. Restaurant people don't sue usually, you know, because it's opinion is protected in this country. And if you set out your facts as to why you think the restaurant is lousy, then you set out your facts, and so you can have an opinion. Therefore, the restaurant's lousy. Occasionally, though, you know, they do sue. So um, there was a uh, case in in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania uh, where a restaurant where a restaurant sued over a bad review, and um, they said. The, the review had said, well, this place is lousy. Among other things, the steak is really tough. And the restaurant sued, saying, hey, you know, we pulled your receipt, Mr. Reviewer, and you didn't have the steak. You had the steak sandwich. And that's a completely different thing. And um, <laughs> It has steak in it. <laughs> okay. di different, different cut. And so um, that case, I believe, settled. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so it does happen. Okay, yeah. good for the restaurant. Good for them. Yeah. Good for them. So, um, yeah. Did you have did you have conflicts with editors and writers over? I mean, did you have arguments? Oh, sometimes, sometimes, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it most most writers, I think, when after they've worked with a you know a, a good lawyer, end up trusting the lawyer and but still you often so, you have sometimes have arguments and and sometimes people are young and they or they or they're not young but they haven't worked with you know me <laughs> and or they might think that we're out there trying to to stifle them in some ways which generally we're not you know we really want to be doing the more aggressive not less aggressive lawyers are lawyers are your friends and uh, we want to do more aggressive help them do more aggressive reporting um, but sometimes there would be a difference of opinion. And in the, you know, the beauty of it, actually, as at least for me, has always been that all I can do is make my best argument and then bring it to the editor-in-chief. And the editor-in-chief gets to decide. And so if I say, hey, this is a risk. You're going to run this. You know, this is, if we run this or we run this word or we run this thing, you know, I think we're likely to get sued. The editor-in-chief at every place I've worked at has the power to say, you know, thank you very much, Lynn, we're going to run it, or thank you very much, Lynn, you know, why don't we see if we can come up with a different wording. And so it's not, you know, it's not, I don't want to say it's not my job. It's my job to identify the risk, but the decision, you know, that it, certainly at the New Yorker was with David's, David Remnick. So um, it, does, it does sound like a wonderful job. Why did you leave? Uh, so it was it was a dream job. I, I want to be you know clear about that. Uh, New Yorker was really terrific, and um, I was there uh, for quite a while. And I left for you know for really three reasons. One was um, in 2013, which is when I was thinking of leaving. Like the biggest news story, I mean maybe up until now, happened, which was um, the Snowden leaks and the fact that our government. The first stories that came out were, um, if you guys recall, were that the U.S. government had been collecting phone records, not just of suspected terrorists, you know, that would have been one thing, but for the phone records of every single American 
um, under the uh, secretly and without any kind of warrant, and under the idea, under the idea, under it was under the Patriot Act, but that it would be somehow relevant to terrorism investigations, and and I thought that was the most you know fantastic journalism, um, fantastic reporting, and the biggest story in the world. And I was had been so I was following it you know really closely, and so when the opportunity came up to start to join this. Um, startup, Piero Midiar, another you know, billionaire, had decided to fund um, the startup that was going to do a bunch of different things. But one of the things it was going to do was set up a national security focused website that um, would have Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras as its founding editors and working with the Snowden documents. I was like, wow, this is, this is fantastic. And, and the fact, then there were some other elements of it, which were that it was also going to have these other you know, verticals that, uh, at least initially, as initially designed, it was going to have national security, it was going to have investigative journalism, it was going to have a bunch of other types of digital sites. So I th saw it was an opportunity to become a real, I had done national security work at the New Yorker, clearly, with Jane Mayer and Cy Hirsch and a number of other stories, which is why you know, they, they wanted me. But I thought it was an opportunity to really become a, um, a real national security expert, one. As two, I thought, now, at the time, New Yorker had a very, and has now very much a very vibrant, you know, digital presence and a lot of video, but it's still not viewed, and even still now, and this is, you know, four years later, really it's not viewed as a digital uh, first web uh, product, even though it is. And so a lot of it was packaging for me. I wanted to be a digital general counsel. I thought it would serve me well in my you know, future. Um, and um, so that was another reason. And I wanted to, and, and Pierre Midiar was committed and still is committed to serving the First Amendment and uh, to spending some money and helping with First Amendment philanthropy. So it was really kind of a great package. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, you, so you told me that uh, one of the things that you were dealing with legally there was uh, the question of receipt of stolen property and what to do with that, is that? Um, well, I wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, one of the questions was, you know, we, uh, so Ed, Ed Snowden took, you know, whatever number, a significant number of documents from the NSA, and he provided them, as I think, you know, has been told uh, many times to Glenn Greedwald and Laura Poitras, and they provided them to access, you know, to the intercept. And so those were, um, I wouldn't call it receipt of stolen, I mean, that's what it was. He was very open about it, but, you know, we did have access to, uh, to those, that material. And so, um, and to other, and then subsequently other number, a number of other people have leaked information to the intercept and through different, through different means. So were you, were you dealing with the government? So, yes, we were dealing with the government really on every story that involved any governmental documents as a matter of practice, um, and I think this is good practice, frankly. Um, as a matter of practice, we would call the government up and we would say, listen, we're going to report this and we're going to, we're using this document and we're reporting this and do you have a comment? Um, and in m most cases, they didn't have a comment, but occasionally they would say, uh, don't, don't publish this or don't publish this element of it. Um, because it's going to put people's lives at risk or what have you. And sometime, when sometimes we would, we would ask them, um, well, you know, give us a little more. Like, why is it going to put, why, why should we not publish this? And, and sometimes there was a back and forth on this. And sometimes we'd listen to them and sometimes we wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And decisions. were you were you making those calls or as general counsel? I was involved in those calls. The, edi the, I mean, the editor also, and the editors would also make those calls, but yeah. Did you have legal challenges from the government? We, we were not, when I was there, ever ever sued by the mm -hmm. government. We spent all, you know, we, we got outside advice uh, on occasion, and, um, but we were never sued. Outside advice? No, no, I mean, like, we were well advised. I mean, I don't want to think it was just like a bunch of, you know, yahoos in an in a office room. I mean, we, we, took the, we took our responsibility very seriously, oh. and yeah, that's all I I'm wasn't, saying. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. Um, I was not suggesting yes. that you were a yahoo, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and what, did, you, did you sue the government? No, I mean, not 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 over any of those things. We, mm -hmm. I mean, we brought you know FOIA litigation and and some access, perhaps some access stuff. We and we funded other people doing work, but not in any fashion that way. Um, we did sue, or we at least we supported. Um, we set up a, and it's it's still in existence, and it's actually been funded. So I'm telling you all, if you know about this, there the first look has a uh, press freedom litigation fund. Um, which will fund third-party 
um, lawsuits against the, either offensively or defensively. So if somebody is sued uh, for defamation, you know, defensively you can come to the fund and seek financial support to help you defray the cost. And if you want to bring an access case or a FOIA case and you can't afford it, you can go to the fund and seek funds to help you do that. It's a really phenomenal um, fund. And one of the first things that the fund did was support David Miranda, uh, who was Glenn Greenwald's partner um, at the beginning of the Snowden um, uh, sort of episode, had been stopped in Heathrow Airport and detained for nine hours, and his electronics were all taken from him. And we brought, he brought suit, but, um, and first the Guardian, the Guardian paid for the first tranche, but we paid for the second tranche, the appeals saying that that was a violation of essentially that it was an overstepping of um, by the British police, um, overstepping of their terrorism act, that they knew he was a journalist and they couldn't just, you know, grab him and detain him under the terrorism act. And we, uh, we, uh, we won on appeal. So that was good. Um, okay, so oligarchs versus Scientologists versus the U.S. government. Who's it's been a great career. Who's, yeah, but who's the meanest of those? Still the oligarchs? Well, you know, the, the U.S. government, as I said, never sued us when I was okay. there, so I'm, I'm, I'm withholding judgment. Okay. But okay. I will say right now, the, this administration has is, is been pretty, um, you know, verbally, verbally n offensive to the press, I will say. Um, let's talk about that. Okay. Uh, so, the, you know, what is your sense? They haven't actually, you know, Trump talked about, uh, you know, improving the libel laws, right, um, making it easier to sue journalists. He hasn't actually done that. He has enough. No. And so what, would, so what do you feel like there's a, what do you feel is going on? Is there a chilling effect? Might there be some sort of move to do that? I, you know, I think he has really, I, I think, first of all, libel is back. You, if you haven't heard it before, you'll hear it from me now. There have been a huge number, a very significant number of new libel cases sort of filed against traditional media in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you Sarah Palin suing the New York Times. That was fortunately kicked out of court. Um, Bob Murray has brought lawsuits against HBO and John Oliver and the New York Times, also a ridiculous case. Um, there, I mean, there's been, you know, some high, some really, uh, lots of people are thinking, you know, we had Ahmed um, Gizmodo now, which is the publisher of, of the new publisher of the former Gawker, and of course, you know, Gawker was put into bankruptcy. It wasn't a libel case, it was a privacy case, but still was put into bankruptcy by a well-funded um, litigation. And um, you are being, uh, are you being s the Twitter? Oh, so yeah, yeah. so I'm going to come. Let me okay. come. Okay. Uh, yes, and we are, you know, we are, you know, being sued. But libel is, um, and actually, as, as, as Keith references, we have we recently been sued for, you know, a, a twible, which is a tweet libel um, by uh, uh, Cassandra Fairbanks, who, um, who was, um, who tweeted out a photo of herself in Mike Cernovich at the White House making the sign. Um, and uh, and then our writer tweeted, retweeted it, essentially saying something along the lines of white power at the White House. And Fairbanks then sued, uh, saying, well, you know, that was just an okay sign and that was defamatory. Uh, in any case, that is, um, they've just filed an amended complaint and, and we will, we're, you know, defending it quite vigorously. Um, so, but, but libel is back. Um, and I do think, you know, coming, I think that Trump is not responsible for that, obviously, but he has, com he has, our president has contributed to the atmosphere with which people feel that they can uh, bring crazy claims against uh, the media and, may and maybe win. And hey, so he has definitely helped. But I also think, I mean, I think he's both helped it, but I also think his whole election was, was a response in some ways to, um, to how the public was already feeling, you know, and I, I think that people really felt, you know, I'm interested to hear what you think or anyone here thinks that the, you know, the media, the major media, the mass media was um, was maybe run by elites. I don't know, but not reflecting, reflective of of their concerns. And also, I think that people generally, not around the mass media, but I do think that people have felt a loss of control over their information about their about you know their private information and um, and this is all this is all kind of a response you know it's not a perhaps a well thought out response but mm -hmm. I do think you know Trump is both a symptom and a, um, 
a cause, a cause and a symptom of, uh, of, of some of this. Um, so, y yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it's interesting. Let's, um, I'm going to keep asking questions, but people should start coming up to the mic for the Q&A. Um, it's interesting that, I mean, most of the ones that you've mentioned are right-wingers bringing s suits against the kind of ma the mainstream media, right? So are, have they rediscovered the wonderful court system in our country, or did they never forget it, or wh what's that, what's your read? Well, no, I mean, I think, I think that is part of it. But one of the things that, you know, I think is going on um, as well is that you having a state court, you're ha you are seeing the return of crazy, out of control state court, um, both judges and, and juries. Um, so if you think back to New York Times v. Sullivan, which I already mentioned, but you Can know. Can you tell us what that yes. is? Yes, so New York Times v. Sullivan is the case that, uh, where the Supreme Court actually said, well, you know, the First Amendment, uh, r rather that libel is governed by the First Amendment. It constitutionalized libel law. And it was about a, what had happened there is uh, there had been a political advertisement um, in the New York Times, uh, which had a few errors. It was a civil rights focused ad. And it had a few minor errors. Um, you know, it said, uh, it was a, it talked about Martin Luther King um, being arrested and had the wrong number of arrests. And it said that the pro student protesters at the University of Alabama had, um, had been singing uh, my country tis of thee, or it said, that, and they had been singing the national anthem, or reverse. I always get those confused. Um, and in any case, the the police commissioner, uh, L. B. Sullivan, who was not named in the ad, brought suit in um, in Alabama um, over a minute, minute number of newspapers. Right, there were like 34 copies of the Times. This is um, in the 60s, and um, in all in this whole Birmingham County. And he went to court in, in Birmingham, and he won, saying that he was defamed by this ad, which doesn't mention his name, and which doesn't actually have any real substance there. And he won a verdict um, of a half a million dollars, and it was, the verdict was upheld by the Alabama Supreme Court. There were also, this is in those footnotes that you guys probably don't want to read, but there were also like four other uh, suits over the same ad brought by different public officials in Alabama pending um, lined up in Alabama, and I think the Supreme Court took this case. There's a great book on the case by Anthony Lewis, which I suggest you all read if you're interested in this, but basically I think the Supreme Court took this case because the, the national media was getting boxed out of covering national events. They couldn't cover the civil rights movement um, because these local juries were ha assessing you know, horrible damages, ruinous damages against them. And so out of that came this idea from the, the Supreme Court there. That's where they created this idea of actual malice, you know, that you had to, that you had to prove actual malice and where they have this great language, which is true about how the purpose of the First Amendment is to, uh, is to criticize government, is to shine light on what the government does. So it is a full circle. What we're seeing now is a return to some of those ruinous damages. So you had, a hun you know, you had the, the $135 million verdict from six jurors in Florida um, for the Hulk Hogan privacy case, which never would have withstood uh, an appeal. Um, you have um, uh, this horrible, um, a horrible, horrible uh, settlement just um, a month ago um, in the uh, Pink Slime case you know, with involving ABC um, and uh, Beef Products International, um, where ABC settled in the middle of trial. Uh, for a, at least, and a likely much, much more in terms of insurance payments. But ABC itself paid out about $177 million, which by itself is the largest libel settlement ever before. Um, and that was, they were before, uh, to, I'll bring it to home, they were before a hometown South Dakota jury who had heard, who had, with a bus local business who said that they had been crushed by ABC's reporting on Pink Slime. Mm -hmm. And they, um, you know, I'm not part of, I'm not privy to what ABC decided, but clearly they decided that they were better off settling for crazy, crazy amount of money than dealing the po with the possibility of getting a $2 billion verdict against them, trebled, because it was under this, these um, ag-gag laws, it's also probably unconstitutional. So I think that's the rise of um, localism again. Mm -hmm. I might be misusing the word localism, but yes. yeah. Interesting. Um, thank you. All right, that's, yes. So on the topic of frivolous lawsuits, um, I also heard about 
a Mother Jones case where the Mother Jones actually won the suit, but the they still lost a ton of money just from being sued. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, is there any way to stop uh, companies from just doing lawsuits that they know that they're going to lose just to kind of bleed that media organization dry? No. <laughs> I mean, really, in the end of the day, there really isn't. I mean, it is a, if at the, ver the at the, um, uh, if it's truly a frivolous lawsuit and you can prove that, you can file, you know, what's called a Rule 11 motion, and, you know, and have, try to get it dismissed on that ground and have sanctions against uh, the plaintiff, but, but, those, those, you know, nobody really loves sanctions. And then there is this idea of anti-slap, which are anti-strategic lawsuits against public participation. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of a double negative, but those are statutes that exist in many states, um, not all states, that say that if you are suing to stop somebody from speaking or from public participating publicly, then you can have essentially an early uh, motion to dismiss against that suit, and that usually you can get attorney's fees. And so that's actually a pretty powerful tool, um, but there are a lot of restrictions on it. A lot of states don't have it. The federal courts have been balking. Um, there's a whole, you guys probably are not interested in this, but there's a whole ongoing sort of circuit split decisions about whether there's, it's a substantive or procedural uh, law in the states, and so whether they should apply in federal courts or not. So federal courts in many places aren't applying the, the state anti-slap, um, and so then you're not getting the benefits of it. Um, we don't have a federal anti-slap law, um, which would be great to have, but you know it's hard to get anything through Congress. So um, in New York, which has an anti-slap law, it doesn't cover really general reporting. It's, it's uh, much more focused on um, committee meetings and like public process. Whereas California has has a very wide, broad anti-slap that does would co does cover mu much of the media. Oh, so we need to improve our anti-slap. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Frank Williams. I am actually one out at the law school. We went over Rule 11 today in CivPro. Um, um, but I was just wondering what types of skills um, or even like work experience and internship experience and even classes that you think would be helpful for law students and young lawyers interested in kind of getting into media law. So. Um, the you know the the best the biggest thing is to do is to demonstrate your interest so you know any internship you know domestically or internationally that you can get that has something to do with the press helps or the media um, you know I take con law I take First Amendment I never took at Columbia uh, copyright and I do a huge amount of copyright work now so you know who knows you know I, I should have taken copyright clearly and then I should have taken international copyright and take either of them so. Um, it's really, um, I, would, I would take, I mean, I would take First Amendment and I would, you know, take, there is, I think, a media law seminar that's offered in the upper classes at the law school. And I would, but I would really, what we people really want to see is that you have an interest in it. Um, uh, so, that's what I do. Hi. Um, so you mentioned a little bit earlier uh, about verbal and also written contracts. And I, some professors said that reporters just totally disregard off the record as meaning anything and so I'm just wondering um, like are they placing themselves in legal, legal jeopardy by doing that is that considered a verbal contract well that's a very cynical professor you have <laughs> um, it really is going to depend it can off the record can absolutely be a contract and there are cases that suggest that um, so you so one of the questions is going to be you know is that documented anywhere did you agree in writing that can you say it was it fuzzy did you go back to it did you condition it like you know I'll keep this off the record but or I'll keep or I'll go back to you my what I will say is that nobody and I hope your professors all have said this too is that you can you know I suspect that even in this rarefied room if we ask people the difference between on background was not for publication off the record on deep background um, not for attribution everybody would have completely different answers for what each of those mean and that's part of the confusion and so you know my advice to journalists is just be really clear about what you were agreeing to and when you say I'm going to keep something confidential or when you say I'm going to this is off the record 
be clear, um, because sometimes people hear that you will go to jail for them before you reveal their name, and really all you mean is you're not going to identify them by name in your story. And those are really clearly two different things. And if you're going to go to jail for somebody, you want it to be a really good story, and a really, really, really good story. And you want your editor to agree that you can do that, make that agreement. First of all, thanks for taking the time on your uh, Monday evening to be with us today. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what so in this kind of brave new world that we're in of uh, fake news and alternative facts, um, what what role do you think the legal system has, if if any, uh, in sort of defending, I guess, like evidence or reality-based reporting in media? You know, it is such a tough question. Everyone's been trying trying to figure it out and to figure out. Um, what you can do about it. It is a, I mean, I, 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 think it, I think it's somewhat of an issue of branding, you know, that you should go when in people's news sources to brands that you trust. I don't mean brands in a cynical way, but I mean, if, you, if there is an author or a blogger that you trust, or The Times, or The New Yorker, or The Intercept, or, or Gizmodo, you know, then, then, then use them and look at them and see who it is. If, it's, if, it, if there's an article coming from somebody you don't know, then you should get you know, should perhaps give it less credence, right? But that's not much of a solution. Um, I am really wary of regulatory responses to it, to deciding, you know, I think that that's where it does run up against the First Amendment pretty firmly. So it's, it's a tough issue, um, yeah. Hmm. Hi, you, you, I'm a law student who used to be a journalist. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about FOIA and particularly, I feel like when I was a journalist, I never got any training on FOIA or how uh, it actually works. And as a law student, I did a research project on the New York FOIA law. And it turns out there are like very specific things that you're supposed to do and if you don't get a response, then your option is to sue. And so I'm wondering if, I'm a journalist who didn't get a FOIA response after the 30 days after the appeal, and I am considering appealing or suing. Like, how long realistically is that going to take? Do agencies generally cop up the material after you sue them, or do you actually have to litigate it? No. Well, those are really great questions. Um, so, very briefly, um, FOIA does FOIA and FOIL. State laws all set out for sort of processes to do that, and usually you send a request, you don't get a request, you don't get a response. You send an appeal letter, uh, you don't get a response, then you can sue. Um, and if you're successful suing, by the way, you will get you can get attorney's fees, but it is not a quick process. Um, it's very rare. I mean, occasionally it's a quick process, but it's very rare. Um, that it's a quick process, so it's hard to use it as a way, like you know you have a story that's running in November, you're gonna sue, you want these documents, you're never gonna get your documents by November, um, even, if, even, even if you sue. But in many cases, just filing the lawsuit does jumpstart the process and you will get some documents, maybe not all of them, but some. Not, and, not, and, and it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, you know, if it's a national security type document, uh, the government is likely to you know, fight um, so it's pretty complicated. What I will say is that uh, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press has really great, great FOIA resources on its website, and they also have a guy you can call up um, and, uh, and ask, uh, which is helpful. The um, Yale Law Clinic, um, I know it's a different school, does quite a bit of you know, public access work and likes to work with individual freelance journalists um, for that reason. And the Knight Center here um, hasn't, really moved so much in that direction yet, but it's very new, and I bet if you went to talk to Jamil Jaffer, who runs the Knight, the, you know, the Knight Institute, he'd be really helpful. And so maybe he'll yell at me, but I, I you know, I, and they, so I would, I mean, I, there's a lot of ways you can get some expertise, you know, on, on this. And, I, and as a lawyer, um, or as a law student, what a, great, what a great research project. So that's the, you know, I'd encourage you to do that, then write about it. I have a friend who recently, um, he's about to win attorney's fees for a FOIA lawsuit, and he's very excited, and he, he's figuring out how to spend all that money. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah it's, yes. it's right. It's yes. good, right? Yeah. Hi. So I'm a journalism student who's formerly a lawyer. I have two unrelated questions. So can you, I guess, talk a little bit about the difference between legal ethics and journalistic ethics, specifically when you were at... Um, when you were at the intercept and the way that they might have intersect intercepted? No. 
Um, I mean, no, I mean, like, I have not really ever had an issue where I feel my legal ethics and my journalistic ethics have conflicted, um, frankly. So, you know, I hope that's, you know, that's, uh, um, I've been able to talk myself into everything. No, so I think, um, so I, I don't think that they necessarily conflict. Um, the, you know, where, where, where in some ways the legal ethics are, are sort of, um, and you may know this, feel sometimes a little crazy is the, but, but I obey them, is, um, is the incredible amount of confidentiality that you owe your client, um, whoever your client is. And so even if you think your client is doing something wrong, um, you are not permitted, you know, legally. I mean, it's not. I'm not talking about murdering anyone because then you are permitted to do something. But I mean, like uh, some sort of corporate crime or something else. You, you're not permitted to do anything with that information. Period. And that sometimes seems contrary to the journalist uh, approach. So there's a tension there sometimes. But I, uh, but I won't say that that ever came up in the Intercept by any means or, you know, anywhere. Yeah. Any other but question? if it had, you couldn't tell us. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Other question. It's more, I guess, to where you are now, coming off of the Gawker Hogan case. Um, I think courts have kind of been less likely to side with the media in terms of what is considered newsworthy. So, do you think, given the people that you're working for now, that they might act more conservatively when it comes to publishing something, or does that play into it at all? I've seen no evidence of that. I mean, you know, I think the reason they hired me is because I'm a journalist lawyer, you know, and they want to be in a position to do aggressive journalism. So I haven't, I haven't seen any um, issue there. I do think, I, I, I mean, I think you're right, certainly that the local jury in Florida, which again was before I was there, decided, did not think that the reporting that, you know, Gawker had done on the sex tape was newsworthy. However, you know, two federal judges had had found it to be newsworthy and uh, thrown the front, th not thrown the claims out, but had suggested that they weren't going to survive um, as some suggestion. So, um, but I, th but I think you're, I think you're right in, you know, that there are, there is a lot of respect and maybe, and maybe even increased respect for the idea of privacy here um, across the board. And we'll see how that plays out. Um, even as everyone gives all their information up all the time to, to Facebook. Um, but yeah, and so, so, I mean, Gawker is a, is a, is that a precedent? I mean, it, it's not, what is that? It's, it's not a precedent, but it is a precedent in that juries can give away a lot of money um, and then they can bankrupt a company. And it's some level of a precedent that, you know, rich people can finance other people's lawsuits um, and bankrupt media organizations. But it doesn't have any legal precedents, I don't think. Um, personally. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a jury verdict from six people that was settled before it went to appeal, so, um, so it doesn't have presidential value. So if someone brought you a sex tape at Gizmodo, would you have to think about the, what happened with Gawker? How could you not? I mean, if anyone brings a sex tape to anybody, you have to think about it, and you have to see the circumstance of it and, you know, make a decision. May no one bring you a sex tape. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay. That's right. What are your thoughts on the legal pluses and minuses of going undercover? I know ABC had a big case on this. What do you do if you've heard that a nuclear power plant, for instance, has something really wrong, and the only way you can find out about it is to lie about who you are and go work there? Is that okay, or are you exposing yourself to very large legal risks? Both. Well, I mean, both. The answer is you are. It is probably okay, and you are exposing yourself to very large legal risks. Um, and it is, uh, so you're referring to the Food Lion case yes. and where they hired, some of the associate producers were hired by, uh, got hired on uh, as grocery store workers and wore hidden cameras and showed really poor food ha sanitary preparation issues and then were sued. And um, ABC lost a trial and uh, lost a pretty, lost, I think it was a $6 million verdict, which was huge at the time. It was reduced, it was remitted to, I think, $300,000, and then it was basically thrown out on appeal. But, um, and that was good. Um, it was really good. But you st always are going to run the risk of having a fraud claim brought again. I mean, it depends on the circumstance, right? So nuclear energy may be a whole, you know, federal regulated, federal, federally regulated industries may have a whole additional level of laws that you might be breaking 
if you were in there under false pretenses, I don't know. But um, you should absolutely consult with a lawyer before you do it and f figure out if there's a way to do it with, with the least amount of, of risk. Um, and and the, the, you know, the one thing I'll say is that um, the story, I mean, you know, I, in my mind, it always depends on what the story is. Like, you know, you don't want to go undercover and raise, that, raise the specter of that kind of legal risk unless it's, a, unless it's a really good story. Would it mitigate your risk at all just not to answer a line on the application who you are? Or is that still going to give you just as much legal problem? Well, it will depend on what the application is. But yeah, probably if you're not, you can, if you're not affirmatively misrepresenting, if you're not affirmatively lying, you can still, listen, you can still be held liable liably for, you know, not a, for a misrepresentation if they, if it's a reasonable, if they reasonably rely, if it's reasonable that they rely on your, your lie or your, or your omission. So omissions can be, you know, leg legally cognizable as well. But if you don't ever sign, if you don't sign something that says, you know, I'm going to keep this confidential, then, for example, you know, or uh, then you're in better shape. So yeah, in general, in general, not lying is going to put you in a better place. place. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do we have one last question back there? Okay. Um, how much can you tell us about the Intercept's media lawyer's work in the reality winner case? What is I that? can't tell you anything about the Intercept's <laughs> media lawyer's work in the reality winner case. Um, I wasn't there, um, and they had outside counsels be in between, um, and um, so, and I can't, you know, can't disclose uh, anything I might know otherwise. But what I will say about Reality Winner, and so Reality Winner is a um, government contractor who was arrested and is being charged with uh, violations of the Espionage Act for allegedly leaking uh, material to The Intercept. And the material that she allegedly leaked was a, a government document that had the first, I think, concrete proof of um, that the Russians had hacked into our elections. So they intercept got this material. Okay, she sent it, you know, there are plenty of ways to try to send material like this anonymously now. There's secure drop, there are other ways. And she, but she sent it the old fashioned way, which is in an envelope with a stamp. And, um, and they got this document and they had no idea this is all based on publicly reported information, by the way. <laughs> I want to be clear about that. They had no idea who um, she was, right? Uh, who, who anyone was, who the source was. So they got this document that is incredibly uh, newsworthy, if, it's, if, if it is a real document. And, um, and it, it's very possible. The Intercept and at other places, as you think about all of the stories, there, there are many attempts to hoax the press, on, especially on issues like this, and especially in this political environment. So the most important thing for The Intercept was to um, um, make sure that that was a real document before they reported it. And, um, and as one of the reporting steps, um, they had to go to the government and say, hey, we're going to report on this document, and you know, what do you have comment? And by the way, the government did have comment. And so The Intercept um, did not, when they released the document, release the entire thing. Parts of it were redacted because the government had asked them to do it. But one of the other things the government did was say, hey, this is our document. Who's printed this document out? And, um, and then they went and looked at their work computers. Um, and they said, oh, well, you know, six people, I think it was six, have worked have, have printed this document out, and only one of them has been inter, uh, emailing with The Intercept. And then they got a search warrant, and then allegedly she said, yeah, it was me. That's all alleged, because you know it's not there. So I actually think that they, um, um, and she had been emailing not about, like, hey, I'm going to send you confidential material, just like asking about a podcast or something. But still, she had done this, you know. So she allegedly was sloppy, you know. I mean, but on the other hand, many sources aren't spies. Journalists aren't spies. So, like, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate. But, you know, the government's job is in some ways to figure out who is what, you know, to preserve, to figure out who has their documents and how they're getting on. So, um it's really, really unfortunate, I think, but I actually think that whatever happened with that um, 
story and that's you know source that she would have been discovered very 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 quickly um because she had been emailing with the intercept you know i think like that's the you know that's that so that's you know i don't know if that answers your question but but that's what i think and i also think they could not report that story without authenticating it that document so it's a great um it's a really you know you should all go back and reread the journalism which got lost a little bit in some of the brouhaha about a reality winner's arrest. Um, so, um, you know, that's what I'll say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I have one final, uh, very kind of uh, lighthearted question, and it's very nerdy, uh, but uh, I, I just wanted, I've always wanted to ask, um, were you there for the digitation, digitization of The New Yorker? Uh, no, that was Ed Claris, my predecessor. Do you know why they did it the way they did? Is it because of copyright? Um, you mean in terms of doing the, all the, you know, like a, a full on a yeah. facsimile version? Um, I don't, I don't actually know. I don't remember. I think I did know at one point. Okay. Why is it? I have a theory it's, that it's, it's because it, be, well, it's very hard to use, but my theory is that it's that, well, that way they didn't have to go and call people up in their estates and it's, it's, clear it, it with everyone. It is possible because there had been a, you know, there was the whole Tassini litigation. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it is possible coming back to that, but I don't really remember <laughs> the reason. Okay. Okay, Sorry. I'm going to keep my search going. Um, Lynn Oberlander, thank you very much. Thank you.